out of the case regulator. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, the DEC had a condition in there for plantings uh, and a requirement for plantings if they weren't going to put the ICE new upgrade sanitary system in, mm -hmm. but they are. So that DEC requirement is moved. So, um, Matt, what are your thoughts? I, I mean, I don't have any issues with it. With what we've Together. What we've already discussed, it's been discussed a few times. They're moving the IA system out. The, the grade is relatively flat. There's a substantial uh, existing vegetative buffer around the title, uh, the freshwater wetlands. Um, so would we strike that clause? So you can make the motion to adopt the resolution as written, except for the condition okay. requiring the vegetation plan. You know, as the condition of approval, and then we'll make that adjustment after. I think, especially given the fact that we have specific things about uh, in the movement of the of this. Uh, where is it? The thing I do all the preserve the preserved trees. I think that was the biggest issue there. I think. Yeah. I think everything else is something we're concerned about, and that's a separate. Mm -hmm. Items. So I don't think it hurts us. Pull out the equivalent number two. Okay. Otherwise, I'm I'm happy with this. Yeah. Um, Agreed. We did re review the CAC points on this one. Um, relocate studio stair clear of adjacent regulated area. They're in essence doing that. Mm -hmm. um, minimum disturbance of 15 by 15 to the adjacent regulated area. They're doing that. And then vegetation plan for disturbed areas, relocation of studio perimeter of new addition. And, and for, for me, that's just uh, foundation plantings. Yeah. And we just discussed that. So, yeah. well, okay, then I'll make a motion to accept resolution 26 of 2023, 457 South Ferry Road, uh, with the removal of. Uh, H3, um, H2, 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 or the approved landscape plan? It's H2, but it's also H3C. Right. So H2 and H3C. Yep. I'll second, I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The next one we have is an extension resolution for the white roadway bond. Um, they had until 9 October. They submitted, a, a, Aaron Hogue submitted an extension request. And this one will take them to November 23rd of 2023. Um, we reviewed their plan for, uh, they have made some proposed changes uh, at the last meeting, and um, I don't, we weren't happy enough with it, and I'm paraphrasing here, but um, so we asked them to stick with their original scope, which they have agreed to do. So I make a motion to accept resolution number 27 of 20. 23 for the uh, conditional final approval of the white subdivision. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The last extension resolution we have is for HSH 29 Westneck LLC. Again, this is something uh, being run by Karen Hogue. Again, it will extend the application date uh, for recording of the deeds to November 23rd, 2023. This one sounds like she's very close to having those deeds approved. And, and she has submitted. She has submitted them to me, so I'm just going to re I'm reviewing. So you're just reviewing it, uh, and this is um, for the 
uh, sanitary rights transfer credits for uh, Leon to get involved here. Um, so I'm glad this one's moving ahead. I make a motion to accept resolution number 28 of 2023 for the SH29 Westneck LLC. Second. No in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. And now we have a public hearing for the Loftus uh, Hills TAM application at 169 Ram Island Drive. Um, Catherine, can you read? I'm reading the notice for me. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, we can read it. I don't think that would be appropriate. <laughs> Just to highlight it. Okay. okay. Public hearing regarding the ap an application for wetlands permit by Loftus Hills and TAM. The property, which is the subject of the application, is located at 169 Ram Island Drive, Shelter Island, New York. The applicants are requesting a wetlands permit to demolish an existing single family dwelling, swimming pool, patios, and decks within the vegetative buffer and adjacent regulated and, and adjacent regulated area. Construct new single family dwelling 99 feet from current tidal wetland boundary. Pool 76 points or 77.6 feet from current tidal wetland boundary and patio 75.2 feet from current tidal wetland boundary. Remove existing septic approximately 45 feet 4 inches from the wetlands. Install a new IAOWTS system outside of the regulated area. Construct gravel driveway and enclosure for garbage cans 53 feet from current tidal wetland boundary with 401 square feet to be in existing um, uh, uh, vegetative buffer and 771 square feet in existing uh, ARA. Secra class type two. Okay. Was there any correspondence, Catherine? I thought there, there was one letter in approval, right? And support of. Okay. Um, Beth, do we need the letter read or? Uh, you don't need the letter read, as long as it's in the file. Yeah. We do have some notes from the CAC. Uh, first is resubmit plans after New York State DEC AOC, uh, American uh, Army Corps of Engineers bulkhead approval. Um, no excavation of existing regulated wetlands buffer from plus 12 feet to four feet. Move plunge pool, house, driveway, roof leader, and dry wells out of adjacent vegetative buffer. C129-2 and 129-3. Bulkhead in lieu of COA. Look up FRP, fiber reinforced polymer. Explain answers to D.2 justification for permit. Priors SPDIS, State Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit. Uh, they do not mention whether they're in support or against, but I, so, but these are the notes we received. Uh, Matt, I believe you're here with for representing yes. applicant. Yes, good evening, uh, Matt Sherman with Sherman Engineering and Consulting. I'm here with Clint and Tam. He's one of the property owners. Uh, the other property owner, Patrick Loftus Hills, is on by Zoom. Um, if I could share my screen. Yes. All right, this property is out on the, the north side of Ram Island. It's uh, on Big Ram. Gardner's Bay Drive, is, I mean, Gardner's Bay, excuse me, is to the north, and Ram Island Drive is to the south. It's uh, two and a half acres, uh, 2.3 acres, excuse me. Um, it's got bulkhead on the northern boundary. Part of the bulkhead is, is in bad shape. Part of the bulkhead is in really bad shape. Um, one of the things that the CAC had recommended in their comments was about the, um, the uh, uh, wetlands application that's in front of the DEC right now for rehabbing of that bulkhead. Um, we're still in the process of waiting for that. So uh, the, we had 
Um, we had initially submitted the application to the planning board with a revised bulkhead configuration. At the planning board's request, we removed that because we don't have the approval for that. So we removed that from the application. The, uh, um, if the DEC comes back with an approval to revise that bulkhead as we would like to do, we will come back to you for a second wetlands permit for things that are that will be impacted by that bulkhead uh, that bulkhead work. Um, if the DEC comes back and says we've got a we can replace the bulkhead as it currently exists right now, then the plan that we're presenting tonight will be sufficient to allow for that to happen. There won't be any additional grading or anything like that that will be required within the regulated area. Um, the house that was there right now, it is, so this, this is the survey. This is a blown up version, make it a little bit easier to see. The existing house, uh, according to the town assessor records, is approximately 4,425 square feet living area. Um, 1,200, I think they said 12 or 1,300 square feet of that is in the basement, 1,400, excuse me, square feet of that is in the basement. Um, I, the, the, um, the basement includes a swimming pool, uh, a full-size swimming pool, a, uh, a bar, a game room, um, that kind of stuff. So but that's about half of the basement area, maybe a little bit less than half of the basement area. So the main floor has the other 3,000 square feet, give or take, of living area on this, uh, on this property. As it sits right now, we've got a, the, the wetlands boundary runs along the seaward face of the bulkhead, the northern shore there, and then it comes down to the south a little bit, and then on the neighboring property, it's just a, uh, it's just a beachfront. So it's uh, uh, mean high water. So that's where the, the wetlands boundary comes down here, goes up to the north, and then goes off to the, uh, goes off to the east. The 75 foot setback for the wetlands boundary is this red line right here, and it loops down and loops across. 100 foot setback, just landward of that, same thing. <clears throat> Excuse me, the, uh, the existing house 75 feet, 75.1, so basically 75 feet from that uh, mean high water wetlands boundary. The porch that's on the water side of the house, kind of this corner over here wraps around the front and comes wraps around this corner. That's 64 feet from the wetlands boundary. You come over to this side here where you've got a swimming pool and a, a brick patio around the swimming pool. It's 48.6 feet from the wetlands to the patio and just over 60 feet to the uh, swimming pool from the uh, from the wetlands. So our coverages, just I won't go into too great a detail of them, but you're at uh, 864 square feet of patio, 532 square feet of pool, and 166 square feet of deck, all within the vegetated buffer. So that first 75 feet. Then when you get to that adjacent regulated area, there's an additional 377 of swimming pool, 1,024 of patio, uh, 1230, uh, 1,263 of deck, and 722 square feet of the house are within the adjacent regulated area. The vast majority of this project, of this property, is outside of the wetlands regulated area. Just clean it up a little bit, make it easier to see. Is that patio permeable or not? Yes, it is. There's actually pictures in the building department of the uh, patio when it was being installed, and it's on a compacted sand base. So this is what we're proposing. The uh, blue again is the existing. The green is what's being proposed. And there is a, on that, that um, easterly side of the building, there's about a six foot or so, eight foot uh, um, overlay, uh, overhang of the roof area. The light green line is the building footprint. So you can see it's just inside of that overall green shape. Um, so for this one, we're going now to the ground floor on the west side. We're at 87 feet from the wetlands boundary to the ground floor. There's, um, the, the, you'll see in a, um, an elevation of the proposed building, there's a walkout basement level and then one story on when you're looking at it from the, uh, from the roadside. So that one story upper level <coughs> cantilever is about five and a half feet over the ground floor and that gives us 90 feet to that ground floor. So where the building's actually touching the ground, we're 90 feet from the wetlands boundary. 
Um, there is the, uh, um, I believe it was the CAC had mentioned, or maybe it was in the notice. Um, we're requesting a 56 square foot uh, garbage refuse bin area right next to the edge of the house that is within the vegetated buffer. And we're gonna ask the town recognize that for the one time 100 square foot exemption for new work within that, uh, within the regulated area. <clears throat> Excuse me, the uh, staying on that west side, we've got 110 square feet of house within the adjacent regulated area. None of the house is within the vegetative buffer. And we've got 760 square feet of driveway and walkway. Driveway is going to be gravel. The walkway in this area is going to be on a sand base, but there's 760 square feet of that within the adjacent regulated area. It's right up in here. On the opposite side, heading over to the east, that small pool on the water side of the house, 228 square feet, and it's surrounded by just under 400 square feet of patio that's within the adjacent regulated area. So over 75 feet from the wetlands, less than 100 feet from the wetlands. And then there's a little small corner, I don't even know if I have the control of my mouse here to do it, but right in this area here, there's about 20 square foot of roof overhang that's that goes over top of the 100 foot setback. So it's within the adjacent regulated area. The way that we're, the, the site plan is being developed is right now, the majority other than where there's a swimming pool here right now and a patio, the majority of this area has historically been all turf grass. So, and we'll get into the landscape plan a little bit more in another couple of slides, but right now this is all gonna be a non-turf buffer. So the majority of the first 75 feet is going to be a non-turf buffer. And there is a uh, native vegetation plant mix that's been supplied with the, uh, with the application. The exception to that is this small lawn area right here. And then there's a couple of small lawn areas on the other side as you come off the driveway and come off the, uh, the walkway to areas so that you can access the water side of the, uh, water side of the house. So all of that was basically what we're talking about for the wetlands review. Um, so everything in those slides is what is uh, uh, really under consideration tonight. However, we obviously have to recognize that what's happening landward of the regulated area does impact what's happening in the regulated portion. So right here, we've got our three bedroom, single family dwelling. Um, you've got a turf lawn area just to the south of that, a swimming pool, on the east side of that turf area, it extends down to a two bedroom accessory sleeping building. There's a entrance way and a bedroom to the south and a bedroom to the north with a couple of bathrooms. There's, there's bathrooms in that building and I'll show you a floor plan for that in a few slides. And then further to the south, as you get down closer to Ram Island Drive, we've got a solid surface tennis court. So it's not clay, it's not grass, it's not gonna require any type of irrigation or anything to that effect. See, this here is a uh, um, landscape plan. The, this basically, and unfortunately it's, you know, we've got some small details here. So this, is, um, this has been submitted with your application package. Um, so just for, for, um, for the visual here, it basically goes through what the different components are and where we're talking planning, where we're talking pages, um, traffic driveway, things along those lines. This is a tree plan. So this is what they're planning on planting for trees. Same thing, it's, it's got far too much detail to get into a real, uh, uh, real good look at it on this kind of a format, but just to show the board and show people in the audience that there's been a very, very extensive landscape plan put together for this project. This is understory and ground cover. Um, again, you've got all of your, uh, um, your ground cover and vegetation, native vegetation plantings in this area, with the exception of this little bulb and a couple of walkways. And then the same thing for this lawn, which is on the road side of the driveway. Uh, and again, with the, uh, um, the application package, this information is online at the planning board website if anybody wants to go there and look at it. But it's just a very detailed list of all the different plantings that we're gonna be looking at putting on the site. Um, let me go back and just show another couple of quick things that I missed a second ago. 
um, the sanitary system that they had mentioned in the uh, um, in the notice. It's going to be on the landward side of the house. So we've cited it basically between the house and the accessory building so that it can uh, service both buildings. So we're looking at a um, IA septic system and two leaching rain, two leaching pools to serve that uh, serve those buildings. And the well is going to be down as far landward as we can get it down here by the corner of the uh, by the corner of the tennis court. Okay, so the floor plans for the buildings. Um, this is the ground floor of the basement level for the house. Um, we've got a two car garage. There's going to be one bedroom down here, a laundry room. This is a mechanical room, mechanical area. So that's an unfinished, uh, unconditioned mechanical room. There's a gym, a wine cellar, and what we're calling a bonus room. We're not sure what it's going to be used for. It can't be used for a bedroom because of emergency egress. Um, same thing with the gym. It may be a media room. It might be you know, something along those lines. When we design for the health department, the basement gym and the basement bonus room are both considered bedrooms for the purposes of sanitary design, whether they're used as bedrooms or not. Um, a good analogy to this is, and you're not allowed to, but if you were, if you could put a garbage disposal in your kitchen sink in Suffolk County, when we're designing the sanitary system, we have to treat that garbage disposal as a bedroom. Mm -hmm. So just because the sanitary approval calls it a bedroom, doesn't make it a bedroom. I want to make sure that's very clear. So this building, the existing building that's being taken down has four bedrooms. This building has three bedrooms. That one in the basement there. Then on the first floor, the main floor, you've got a bedroom directly above uh, where the, the garage is in that first floor area. And you've got a, uh, another bedroom here. That's where the building kind of makes that turn toward the, uh, toward the northeast. This is a uh, what we're calling a cocktail room. We could call it a family room. We could call it uh, anything along those lines. It's uh, basically just an extra living room in the house. Um, you've got the uh, dining room and lounge area, great room, if you want to call it that, call it a living room. And then here you've got the kitchen. This is the accessory building. This is the accessory building, and I'll zoom in on that a little bit to make it easier to see. So in this accessory room uh, building, you've got a bedroom down here to the south and a bedroom up here to the north, further to the north. And if you remember, this is located just south of the swimming pool. So further to the north, we've got an outdoor shower and a half bath to serve um, as a convenience for the, sh for the uh, swimming pool. We've got bathrooms here. And we've got a bathroom. God bless you. Thank you. We've got a bathroom here off of the uh, that lower guest bedroom. When you come into the building, you've got this entry area right here, and there's an under counter refrigerator and a sink. There's outside storage here, and there's outside mechanical room and storage here. Let's see. Here's the elevations of the building. So, <clears throat> excuse me, looking at it, um, when I talked to you earlier about the ground floor, that um, is, we got that six foot cantilever, five and a half foot cantilever. That's what we're talking about right here. So the main floor sticks out over the ground floor a little bit. So this is looking at it from the water side. This is looking at it from the road side. And then from the two ends. You've got the garage underneath on one side, and you've got the patio on the other side. Uh, this is the uh, elevations for the accessory building. Um, really just a very, very simple, straightforward design. The maximum height on both of the buildings are, for the main house, just under 25 feet uh, above grade. And then for the accessory building, just over 18 feet above, uh, above grade. And then this is a view of the property. Um, this is yesterday. Uh, it's kind of a, it's a pretty maybe halfway decent view. Um, so, you know, this is looking out, if you were standing about midstream of the house, looking out toward the, uh, toward the north, northwest. Um, this is that area of the bulkhead that I was saying before is failing. Um, that's gonna need to be, uh, you know, hopefully the DEC moves on that application sooner rather than later, uh, because it, it is, it's, 
catastrophically failing and it's only getting worse. Um, the uh, application we submitted to the DEC for the letter of non-jurisdiction for this portion of the project was um, uh, like 18 months ago, and the amount of, of additional erosion that's going on there from then till now is, is startling. So we got to get the, we're, we're working on trying to get the DEC to move on it. I got uh, Jack Costello is ushering that through the DEC now, and he's talked to some of the people at the uh, WMAC about this project over the past several months to, uh, you know, to make sure that when we get through the DEC, we're poised to, to work with them very quickly. So that's what I have as far as uh, a presentation. If the board has any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer any. Um, anything else that uh, that comes up throughout the hearing, just uh, let me know if you have any questions. I have a couple. Um, I've been work looking at the overall package that you had submitted earlier. And uh, there seems to be a, a request for a staircase if you're gonna build this beach structure and then a staircase. What are you gonna, is that just a earthen stairs or is it a, what, what is, how would that be constructed? Um, there's actually, there should be a detail on that, a very original set that we sent, which had stones, you know, large stones would be um, cascaded down as the, um, as the treads. Uh, but that has been pulled off of the application because we're not, at this time, we're not talking about doing that bulkhead. That, that drops the grade down at the request of the board. We, we're no longer dropping the grade down for that bulkhead from 10 feet to about five feet. Mm -hmm. That's what necessitated the, the, the steps going down to meet that new grade. Well, the reason I ask is you're, you're, you're using to, for the garbage bins um, for the square foot exemption. And um, as you witnessed in our CARPE application, we were not even allowed to put a new, um, well, the board didn't feel like we could even offer, allow someone to rebuild something in kind and so this would then seem I don't, know, I don't know this how this applies to that hundred square foot if it if it goes in if it's something you really want then maybe moving the trash bins out can you walk us through the um storm water dry wells are you, you going to have storm water dry wells for this uh, the tennis court yes actually um no not for the tennis court let me pull that up here and see where I'm at. I think it's Yes, that's a big surface of yeah and actually the way that we're, we're handling the storm water for the for the tennis court is it's sloped to the east and there's going to be a swale that runs around the tennis court and it's going to redirect storm water into the planting areas i don't want to you know dry wells are a good solution to storm water control they're not the best solution for storm water control if we can redirect storm water to plantings then that's a far far better way to handle it I know Marcus is very happy to hear this. Okay, good. Yeah, so that's the idea of what's happening around the uh, around the tennis court. Um, pull this back up. And then you have a series of cisterns. Yes, and I and I'm glad you brought that up. I oversized the cisterns on their original design drawing. Um, we need eight thousand gallons of storage. Uh, a ten foot diameter dry well has. Uh, um, we need basically 16 feet of those 10 foot diameter dry wells. So we're gonna need four, four foot deep dry wells. Two eight foot pools. Yeah, yeah it's, um, I would do four four footers just so that we're not getting any closer to groundwater than we need to. Yeah. Um, and then we would have two, um, and those are solid tanks. Those aren't stormwater pools. They don't have perforated sides or an open bottom. Then those solid tanks would then overflow into 10 foot diameter perforated tanks with open bottoms so that if that 8,000 8, gallon cistern gets filled up and we're not using the water, the new storm water that comes into it has somewhere to go. Um, as the, the town code says, we can collect 10% roof area from the equivalent of 10% of the lot size. We're just over 100,000 square foot on a lot size, so we can collect from 10,000 square foot of roof area. We're gonna be collecting from somewhere in the ballpark of about 6,000 square feet. So we're going to be underneath that 10% threshold for collecting stormwater. And those are the cisterns that are to the southwest? Yeah, over by the edge of the driveway. The driveway. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I'm a firm believer in, in the homeowner being able to build in the adjacent regulated area. The CAC is always asking 
um, for things to be pulled back. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go through some of the reasoning uh, why it can't be pulled back uh, even just a little? Because that plunge pool is that's right up against the seventy five setback. Uh, yeah, you know, not, not that again. I, I you know I'm saying that I believe it's someone's the homeowner's rights to do that. I yeah. just want to code allows it. The thoughts are yeah, absolutely. Let me come back here. Right now, your current overall net in the uh, you're definitely out of the, 70, the seventy-five foot, hundred percent almost. It's mm -hmm. a big reduction. That's a big reduction. And then, what's the diff, What's the delta on what's in the adjacent area? It's still a reduction. Yeah, I mean, there's delta. It looks like it's all. It looks yeah, like all a big improvement. For, yeah, for our overall coverage within the vegetated buffer, assuming the garbage bin stay. Yep. We're going from 1,552 square feet to 56 square feet mm -hmm. within the adjacent regulated area. And this is overall. Yep. We're going from 3,386 square feet down to 766 square feet. Yeah. Okay. So, so it's, it's a very, very significant reduction there. Yeah. yeah. Um, the closest structure to the wetlands currently is 48 feet. Mm -hmm. Proposed would be 76 feet. Uh, and this is, eh, I was afraid of this. It's really not that easy to see. I tried to kind of make it uh, uh, light gray and dark gray to make it a little bit easier to kind of see what we were doing here. Um, that's a little bit better there. Um, so the light gray line that comes up here and kisses the 100 foot setback, that's the, um, that's the existing house proposed location. And there's the existing uh, plunge pool. Work with me. My mouse doesn't want to work for me. Um, now, if I pull everything back so that the plunge pool is at 100 feet on the separation distance from the uh, wetlands boundary, what ends up happening is you know, everything pulls back with it. Okay. So the, uh, um, the, the swimming pool, the patio, the, the accessory building, the tennis court. So it all just it's, it's a domino effect. And what that does is then that pushes the tennis court into the front yard setback as far as zoning is concerned. So then and zoning isn't really the consideration for the wetlands permit, but when we were laying it all out, one of the reasons why we took the configuration that we did was because we, we can't encroach on that front yard setback. Same thing, you can see everything's lined up on that easterly side on the 30 foot side yard setback for the exact same reason, to to not have the requirement to go into the uh, to the zoning setbacks. So when you look at that net benefit of how much we're taking out of the vegetative buffer and the adjacent regulated area, um, compared to you know what is going to be left there as to what we started, it's a significantly better site from an environmental standpoint. You couple that with the idea that we're repairing this dilapidated bulkhead and getting rid of all of that turf grass and replacing that with native wetlands vegetation, we're recharging stormwater um, on a minimal basis. We're trying, we're gonna be using most of the stormwater for irrigation and rerouting stormwater rather than going into stormwater dry wells and putting it into swales and vegetated areas. It's just from an environmental standpoint, it's, it's, you know, we are within the adjacent regulated area, but is a, a vastly improved site over what currently exists and what could otherwise be put in here. It would seem like the only other total option if, if you wanted to keep be willing to give something up is to give up the plunge pool, right? Because you have a pool, but obviously then you're heating a pool or doing something to a pool, which is probably more expensive and more. Not so good for water. Do both of the, the plunge pool and the pool have auto covers on? No, they both have auto covers, yeah. yeah. There's no, did you look at all? I don't know. It's hard to tell from this the aesthetic of like if you were to take the uh, accessory dwelling and pivot it. Would that, would that 
Now, we, we, instead of being uh, I can say the aesthetic for trying to find uh, everything out to answer the property. Yeah, I, I assume so. You can ask yeah. Did you think about it? We had looked at not necessarily pivoting it like a 90 degree, but different shapes, different yeah. sizes. And what ends up happening is um, you don't get that that linear feel coming down. No, and, the aesthetic and, is really and more importantly on that, though, is the way the septic is lined up. There's going to be a fair amount of regrading in the area where that septic is. Um, and that's, it's ideal for the fact that we're putting the septic there because it's going to be taking up a lot of that room yeah. that's going to be otherwise regraded. So if I put a building in that area, especially a building on a slab, then there's a lot of fill that's got to come in there. There's, you know, those kinds of, um, those kinds of uh, issues end up cropping up. Is this a lawn panel between the house and the pool raised or is it sunken or? It's, it's flat and then it drops off as you come to the south. There's like a walking path around it. Oh, that's a walking yeah. path, not a retaining wall. There's on the on the west hand side by the driveway. There's a retaining wall there, but the rest of it is not a retaining wall, right? It's just a, uh, there's a couple of paths that kind of meander up through the middle and they come into that path that goes around that that grassed area and the path that's really there to denote the fact that there's a change in material from turf grass to uh, walking path I, and I don't remember off the top of my head if it's going to be a gravel or mulch or something along those yeah. lines. Pine needles. Pine needles. Yeah. Yeah. I do like the fact that nice low low setting in the space. It's pretty impressive. It's not a Huge double story <laughs> building like we've seen go up in a couple yes, of different places exactly, probably yeah. recently. So. And, and that's actually something that, you know, looking at the town code, the wetlands code, if you're within the um, 75 to 100 foot zone and you're on a bulkheaded property, by town code, you could build on the same footprint and go up some stories and not have to come to you guys for a wetlands permit. Yeah. Um, you know, so that is when, when we're looking at it from a consulting standpoint and from a permitting standpoint, trying to figure out what um you know what obstacles are going to have to be overcome the fact that that we are keeping this building so low and keeping it within intents and purposes within and reduced the existing footprint it really ended up uh, um i think coming out to be a very nice project i have a technical question on your mm -hmm. first application you had two stories yeah. uh, why do you have to go back to the health department if you're taking one story off just because it's a different building it's, uh, we're going from it was the main building had four bedrooms. It was going down to three. It also was for a larger square footage. So we dropped down the square footage on that as well. And I, we did get the health department's uh, revised uh, approval for the, uh, for the three bedroom house, just over 5,000 square feet, I believe is the uh, total square footage. And we have copies of this plan that you, you showed us. You submitted yeah. that already? Yeah, not the presentation. I will submit the presentation to you, but all of these plans are a version or another of the uh, what was in with the application, but I'll submit a. Yeah, that what I'm looking at is, is because that still has all that uh, bulk heading stuff from the yeah. and uh, the reshuffle up front. Yeah, and we had submitted new plans to you with the uh, new vegetation plan, the site plan without the bulkhead. So I'm sure that things are kind of no, in, in yes, we we'll have to overlap. <laughs> but I can submit a set, a, a new set of everything from scratch that will be in agreement with the last things we've submitted to the board so that you've got that might be helpful yeah, we don't mind doing that yeah absolutely yeah. that's fine yeah and getting that up on the website too so everybody has equal access to the current going forward does anyone on the audience have any questions uh, or comments about this application get out of the way <clears throat> The first comment has to do with. Can you please introduce yourself. My name is Michael Shatkin. I am a registered architect, former member of this board. My first comment has to do with the vegetative buffer. And it is, I'll say, most uh, gratifying to see to what degree a change has occurred within the applications that we're seeing now. I'll use this one as an example. Vegetated buffer. Vegetated buffers were something which were uh, of limited concern to this, this board. And to the extent that we introduce vegetated buffers as not only on a voluntary basis, but we introduce them 
in our thinking as a way of mitigating the impact of construction within the near shore overlay. The net effect of that is we are restoring the natural condition of our coastline. So again, it's a very promising transition that has taken place within the applications this board is reviewing, as well as the board's attitude toward turf grass versus vegetated buffer. There was a comment made about what is this 25 area about? And I will add, offer up my professional opinion as to what it is about. If you have a condition where you have a 75 foot uh, veget naturally vegetated buffer, that is, that is a uh, fragile construct. And the intention with regard to the 25 foot zone is a, safe, it is a safety zone. It is a zone that is put into place where minimal activities take place as to not damage the vegetated buffer, as opposed to something which is arbitrary and an imposition on the homeowner, in my professional opinion. The second part of the presentation I would like to address <clears throat> is the difference between what we see talked about and what we see in applications and was mentioned by Matt Sherman with regard to the definition of, of a bedroom. And the Suffolk County Health Department, I guess, has long and painful experience with regard to the issue of rooms being identified as dens, rooms being identified as lounges, rooms being identified as bars, et cetera, et cetera. You can put any definition you want on it. And what they allow is one room as a living room and all other rooms that they cannot classify are considered to be bedrooms. Actually, that's not, that's not true. As, as Matt indicated within the earlier part of their presentation, that is, that is, that is their- You're allowed a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, and one room that could be a den office. Okay. Rec room. I, I, will, I, will, I, I, will, I will say that that is, that is a valid correction. But nevertheless, we do see a creep in that regard, and we see in, inconsistencies in that in that regard in some of these applications. And I think it's important that when we are determining the number of bedrooms within a dwelling, especially as it pertains to something which occurred on this site, is the issue of supplemental sleeping quarters versus accessory dwelling units, that we really need to take a hard look at what we're being told, or what we're being presented with regard to, to bedroom counts, because it makes for a very big distinction in what we're dealing with. We're either dealing with something which is permitted in the near shore overlay, or we're dealing with something which is not permitted in the near shore overlay. And we, we can refine exactly what the Suffolk County Health Department says in terms of exceptions to what is a bedroom or what is not a bedroom? They have a very good guidance memorandum, number 19, I believe. I and that's we could established do, by them along the off, offline. But I would suggest that that guidance mem uh, memorandum become a go to memorandum for this board when you're making the distinction. And in this case, it was very clear that we were dealing with supplementary um, sleeping quarters. But if it had, within it, a number of other rooms, we would be dealing with something which might not be quite as, as represented. And that's something which re requires further, further consideration and inspection by this board moving forward, not to be put in, in, into a position. Of do, you have anything else, do you have anything else on this application, Michael? I think everything I reference, I brought back to this application and I can include my comments right now. Sounds great. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Anyone else in the audience? Yes. Anyone on Zoom has any comments? 
Yes, this is Kimberly Ray call, uh, calling in. I do have a comment. I have a comment on uh, an observation made by you, Mr. Chairman, about your very strong belief, and I'm quoting you here, your very strong belief in the homeowner's absolute right to build in the 25-foot regulated area. My comment is that there is nothing in the law, either the case law, regulations, or guidance that, so, that states that. That's just untrue. And unfortunately, I'm afraid that that attitude has infected uh, your fellow board members in my client's matter, which is Seven Chiquit. Kimberly, oh, we're, we're talking. We're, Kimberly, we're talking about this application, 169 Ram Island Drive. Do you Correct. have any comments about this application? I just did. I just commented that your comments regarding a homeowner's absolute right to build within the 25 foot regulated area is incorrect as a matter of law. That's okay, thank you. Case. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Anyone else out in Zoom? Yes, I have a question, Ian. I have Howard. This is Howard Johansson. Howard. Yes, I'm on the CAC. Uh, we actually denied this permit uh, six to zero in our May meeting. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't say so on your letter, on your memo on that you sent us. Our meeting. I, ha I, I have the the synopsis you sent the planning board. This is what we're going after. Uh, it doesn't say whether you support it or not against it. Well, as you know, we have difficulties in the town with the with the uh, clerks a little bit and it might not have been put on there but in the actual meeting we denied it six to nothing okay uh okay this was back in may so i'm just saying that and, and and how did you review the current application or did you review the prior application i only have the site plans for the new application is that what you're referring to What's the, what's the date of the site plan you have? I have, uh, hold on, 9723. I think it is. Sorry? It sounds right, but I have to, I'd have to confirm it. That's probably not, it's probably later than the one you have, since I hear you talking about some other plan. 9723. With what you have, 9723. Well, this one I have, 9723. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What? Bulkhead changes? Um, good, if it's not 720. If, if that's what that's saying, is then most of my have. Okay. Okay, so I would like to, you know, talk about that one a little bit. Um, first of all, I don't know why we don't look at the near shore overlay peninsula, uh, which is 133.12. F3 that says no construction within 100 foot of the wetlands. Um, uh, it's, we, part we, of the town, it's part of the town code and it's more defined <laughs> a little bit than what you can change in 129. But both sections of the code should be considered. And I think that in, if you look at the purpose of both of those sections, it says to protect our wetlands. And this property is over 500 feet long. And I can't see, or my whole committee couldn't see why we couldn't move the whole project back 25 feet. Now, Howard, you, you do understand we're reviewing this in regards to the wetlands code. We don't have any jurisdiction over the zoning code. Mm -hmm. Oh, so who and so the denial letter, if, if the <laughs> denial letter um, felt that there was an issue with uh, 133F2 or whatever, the 12F, um, 12F3, I think, is the exact one, yeah. then, yeah. then they would have written something into it. But we do not have review of zoning. Right. Right. Well, I understand that. And as a conservation advisory committee, we would advise that people would look at that section of the code because it definitely says no construction within a hundred feet. 
of the is weapon. That the, is that the whole reason the CAC denied this application? No, no. I have five other reasons that are in our letter there. You read okay. them off. Uh, uh, we had originally that the the garbage cans should not be in that area. I, I don't know what the details of them are, but they're in the 75 foot. And they're using that as the 100 square foot ex exemption well, that the they're permitted. Rate? What is the construction of that? I, uh, actually, actually, wait, wait, wait. Uh, does it actually, how does that matter actually? I mean, I, well, if they're made out of stone it, or are they made out of metal or are they does how does that affect it down to accept them? We will ask for some details on that, Howard. Okay, that's that's okay. one. Uh, and uh, I just think that you know it's it's ridiculous and it's 500 and something foot piece of land that you can't move it 25 feet back. Uh, we're just advisory committee, uh, you're the legal. Uh, I don't know why it's not being considered. Uh, and I understand what you're saying is that maybe the zoning board. I mean, when we talked to when Matt was talking about getting the clearances and everything, the allowances, maybe the zoning board should be asked that question, why they don't enforce their own code. That would be for the building, uh, building department to make that determination. So how do I get to the building department? Um, speak I mean, to how read. do I put this in writing to the building department? O originally, when the uh, town board was listening to us, they would, you know, act on it that way, and 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 the uh, yeah, building department would look way on. But I understand the zoning board does not want to get involved with wetlands, and if they don't want to do that, now that's just my understanding. But I would like to get that clarified. I think I've, I've had a conversation with you in the past about 133.12 F3, how it's a Scribner's error. It was a not written for how it's being interpreted. It really had to deal with the health department standards for sanitary systems and how they were to be kept out of the 100 foot setback. Uh, it didn't really have anything to do with buildings. And if you read you read that clause, number one and number two. Number three comes in and the, number one says there has to be a 75 foot vegetative buffer. And number two says buildings and structures cannot be within that 75 feet. And number three says um, buildings and structures and the word including should not be in there. Buildings and structures, sanitary systems um, are have to be outside the 100 foot setback. And then that same clause starts discussing the health department standards. So um, I really do think it's a Scribner's error. I, I presented it to the town board for clarification and um, hopefully they will take it up in the near future and, and correct it. If they want to impose the 100 foot setback at that time where they're discussing it, then I think it's valuable that you and your committee and others who would like all construction to be 100 feet back, talk to the, the, you know, be represented in the discussion. But the town board has never, never held a position uh, uh, on that one clause in the past. And, um, and I think it's just for the simple understanding that that was a miswrite. Well, that, that's your opinion. Uh, how do I know that's a miswrite? It's, it's, a, it's a, something I've discussed with many code. people in, in the Excuse town. Me? Excuse I've me? discussed it with many people in the town. And regardless, we're, we focus on 129 and what's been passed to us by the- We focus the on the wetlands here. Yeah, that's what we use. And it's like the rest, of, it's not under, if it was an issue, it would be raised in the denial letter. Right. Can I be recognized when, when we're time? Sure, come on up. Now, based upon this discussion and the seven secret property, no, why, we, why are we just no, we're not discussing that? Okay, okay. okay. I mean, this is a comment, a general comment. We're, we're still talking yeah. about this okay. 169. I refer myself to this application and this discussion and leave the other application out of it. What we're seeing here is that you have been given by the building department, not a board, 
a letter that says, this is what we see as the issues. But it certainly at a higher degree of authority exists the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Planning Board. And what has occurred is the Planning Board is being given applications that certainly the lion's share of the issues pertain to wetlands review. But every application, these applications are not simply wetlands. They always contain issues of concern to the rest of the curve. And what we have done- uh, Can I, can I just ask you, how does, it explain, how does it work with this, this application? Let me, let me finish my comment because it, it has a lot to do with this application. If you want to make general comments to the town board regarding Which changing board? codes, please do that, but not, don't make them here. There was a discussion that was brought up by another committee regarding this application. And it was the issues that were brought up were dismissed for the same comment, revolving around the same comment that I, I have just made, but it was not within the wetlands portion of the code. So my point regarding this application and all applications, but you can leave that out if it's offensive when I say all other applications, is that the review process has been so parceled, you know, that your hands are tied to only deal with wetlands. Thank you for and, recognizing and, that. And recognize, Thank you for recognizing the board. That. And I recognize that. <laughs> please, please talk to the board about it. You must be frustrated and concerned about the other code issues that get swept up within your reviews of wetlands applications, which you are not permitted to deal with, and nobody else is assigned to deal with. Michael, do you have anything specific about this application? This is a comment about the application. I'm going to conclude my comment. Thank you. Anyone else on Zoom have any questions, comments? Hi, it's Stella Lagudis. Good evening. Hi, Stella. Hi, everyone. Um, I, I would like one clarification point, please. And that is, does the planning board believe that they have the ability to refer or to ask the zoning board for uh, an opinion on anything related to this or other similar applications that um, have a component of zoning incorporated in them? No. We do not. Beth, can, you wanna, can you answer that? Yeah, no, we don't. The board does not have that authority. Okay, not thank you very much. Thank you. Hi, Ian, it's Julia Brennan from the Gazette. I just have a quick question. Hi, Julia. Um, I was able to get from Christina, but I think it would be helpful if they were um, provided in advance, and that is uh, copies of the draft resolutions that you guys are working with when you're looking at these um, decisions, uh, just for transparency purposes, and so that it's easier for people to actually understand what it is that you're um, passing. So I would ask that, if possible, you make that a part of your practice going forward. Beth, what's your position on that? Because like today we didn't, we changed something, so. Yeah, usually they're not, because they still have to be recorded at the clerk's office. Usually they're um, available after recording. And this is it. That's the standard. Right, so it's not gonna be in its final form until after um, it's recorded and adopted. Okay. So we, and most, and most, I haven't come across many, if any, jurisdictions that offer a draft like planning board resolution or a draft zoning board resolution prior to the board actually adopting it. Okay, I, I, it's my understanding um, that when you are enacting, when you are enacting resolutions, you have an obligation to provide to the degree that's possible, and maybe it's just not possible under the timing that you have, the draft version of it for the purposes of public transparency, but if that's not your understanding, mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I can follow up with you privately. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, anyone else on Zoom? Um, where yes, do you guys I want? This is Kimberly Ray, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Have you already voted on seven Chiquit? Because I tried to... Yes. 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 Because I I've been on Zoom now since before seven o'clock, and the recording or the the 
nothing came on until apparently after that vote was taken. And I'm wondering why that is. That was my fault. It was 707 that it went on. I didn't turn the video on. Well, I'm I don't sorry. think that that's a valid, I don't think this is a valid meeting then and a valid vote. The public couldn't hear it. It's an open meeting. It's an it's it's open, open meeting. meeting. You can be here. But Well, you also hold it by Zoom, which means that you're required to be certain that the Zoom participants, as well as participants in person, have the ability to be there. And I object on that basis. You didn't it's ensure still that. In fact, I, think you, I think you may have shut us out on purpose. That is absolutely the untrue. The meeting wasn't recorded and, and the Zoom was shut off as well as the video. We couldn't see, hear, or anything. And the recording notice didn't come on until after 10 minutes into the meeting. Isn't this it's close? not a valid vote. It, it's a valid vote and it's a public meeting and we are not required to have Zoom. We do it as a courtesy for mm -hmm. the village, for the town. However, this is a public meeting. Everybody is more than welcome to come and join us here in public in the town hall. We do the Zoom is not it is not, not required. Um, required as a Zoom um, meeting. Yeah, so I don't know what trying to all, hide. This meeting complies with all open meeting laws, and this is a valid meeting and votes taken prior to any issues with the um, recording are still valid. Uh, as long as you make this a virtual uh, hybrid meeting, allowing participation by Zoom and in person, then every participant. It is, is not noticed a, as a Zoom meeting specifically. It is noted. Yes, it is. It is, it is offered. No, it is offered to allow people to use the Zoom, but it is not set up to be a hybrid meeting. So and where does it say that on the website? Know? Yeah, where does it say that? I don't see that anywhere. You don't post they it. They like just that on offer the, the ability, that but it's open. Press. Okay, well, I disagree. Well, it's about. Wait, wait, it's I'm going to regain this meeting and move ahead on this public hearing. Thank you. Fine. Um, I'd like to. Uh, where do you guys feel? Should we close this public hearing? I'm I'm content with everything that's been promoted uh, provided. Matt's going to submit the additional um, another copy of whatever already has been in. We've already received it, so it's it's not like going on. In a September seventh uh, set of drawings this is the correct set of drawings. Okay, but I'll submit another. I'll submit a complete set, cop, another copy, just so you've got one more. And with this presentation, really appreciate and the presentation. Yes, thank you. All right, so I make a motion to close the Loftus Hill and Tam. I have a wetlands application for one sixty nine Ram Island Drive. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Awesome. Okay, so that ends our business meeting. And gets us into our work session. We currently have uh, four subdivision and lot line applications. Uh, the Bloom Minor subdivision. Uh, they have until uh, January 11th to submit their final application. They are waiting on uh, their um, state and county grants and um, for their IA system and. They're also waiting to hear whether they can hook into um, into Suffolk County Water Authority's lines. Uh, we just uh, extended SH29 well, well, Snack LLC's lot line adjustment deadline. We're filing the deeds. We extended the white roadway construction completion deadline. And we have six Daniel Lord Road LLC and three Borough Hall lot line adjustment. On this one, after the last meeting, I sent uh, John Wagner, the uh, applicant's attorney, uh, a list of things that we had discussed and were requesting of him. Um, he did submit some revised plans, and, and for Joe, those were fine. Um, he promised us, but we haven't received it, an affidavit, uh, attorney's affidavit to um, uh, certify the ownership of the 15 foot strip. I think it's called the Gore Strip. And uh, we have not received that from him. Hmm. And um, he acknowledged that the application had to be made to the health department also. 
So the next step on this application would be to um, set up a public hearing. <laughs> But I, I don't know. He didn't. He didn't it's submit the affidavit that he said he was going to submit. Do do we just reach out to him and ask him to, to submit it? And then once he does, and if it looks okay, we can submit it and uh, set up the public hearing in the next week or two. Or do we have to set it up in a public in a work session, the public hearing? Could we? Um, yeah. No. I was going to say, could we? Could we potentially set a date? Tentative with it, with an assumption that we'll get an affidavit by that time. And if we don't, we, we got to advertise. We got to yeah, the whole thing the right way. way. So, so maybe we should. I think we should wait till we get what we, what we need. But if you say, you say I reach out to them tomorrow and say we need this, we, we didn't set the public hearing because we didn't have it. Get it to us, and he gets us to us by Friday. He's not here, or how much time do we need from the time that he gets it to us to set the public hearing? notified by 10 days, but it has to be in by a certain day. Does the, the public report. hearing have to be set during this meeting, during a meeting of us, or can it be set uh, separately? Well, I don't think, no, I don't we think just so. just prepare the meeting and send it to the paper, as long as it goes to the paper. Right. By the date. Then we need to explain to him that if we can't set the meeting till you get us what we, what we asked for. So yeah, I'll, at the meeting I'll, after that, I'll shoot him a note like right. tomorrow. Yeah. I would hate I, I would hate to advertise one and then no, we can't. No, advertise. I wasn't going to advertise, but I'm wondering no, if it would, it would more than likely be our our next meeting. And the question is, it go back ten days? As long as his, right. That's you know his failure to get us what we, we need. Knew we were having a meeting today. I mean, yeah, he could even so, say something about. He it. said he was going to submit it, yeah. right? Yeah, he did. He also said he was going to attend. Yes, he did that too. Sounds like we punt. <laughs> right. Let me let me reach out to him again tomorrow and say if you get us by the end of the week we can we'll set it up but um we can't otherwise until yeah yeah yeah, yeah. okay That's the rules sounds good to me so um do you want to discuss conditions for Hills Town Loftus Hills Town. So we can draft a memo. Did the, hear the hearing close, correct? We closed the hearing. Close the fence. Yeah, 169. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a cricket. He's yeah. in I saw, I saw him. Over here before. Yeah. 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 I'd like to say this is really good progress. I mean, I've been there for, you know, three times already with the previous owner, which was J.P. Morgan Chase Bank. And that was about three years ago. And at the time, the building department asked them to put a fence around the place because it's dangerous. There's a swimming pool in the I basement. Know, around the swimming pool, I remember. There's a pool of water around the whole building. Oh, yeah. Around the whole building, there's two swimming pools. There's one inside and there's one outside. And uh, we went over there. It has that, that you can walk right in. And, you know, it's not secure. It's, it's, and, it's uh, not even in the ground. It's just it's a magnet for kids. And some, God forbid, if some kid drowns in that pool. Well, that's a, I think that's an orthogonal point to the. the yes. The right. 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 It's like, yeah. That's all true. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm good with it. I, I don't. I think the only thing I would, I would wonder, and I think you raised it, which is good, was if they decide, if they do get the approval to do the, um, the bulkhead change, they may want to use their 100 square foot, something other than that, and they may be precluding themselves in some way because they've already taken 55 square feet up, right? Which is, again, we can go forward, and go, go forward with it as is, and then Maybe the owner should tell us. Yeah, it they, then, then they'd have to like, come back and redo it. Well, they're already talking about potentially having to come back. Yeah. And at that point, I guess in that location, they could take the, the garbage back, bins yeah. out. Yeah, true. And move them. Yeah. Well, they could do it. Well, that's a pretty good point, though. Uh, but they could do it later on. As long as they haven't actually done anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the big thing. It's like you just never know how long it's going to take for these guys. They've been okay letting the bulkhead just, you know, fall apart for three years. It might go another two, two more years. You never know. Um, so I would, I would say, my thought would be to say to, uh, again, if we talked about getting a definition of what exactly is under, make sure that even though it actually doesn't matter because you get 100 square foot regardless of what you're doing. Um, 
is, okay, so, oh, is, is to consider approving it with that for that 55 square feet. But let me let me guide the conversation yeah. this way if I can. The proposed action and location will not create a risk of impairing the function and value of the wetland buffer. I think it's everything is improving. It's improving yeah, yeah. substantially. Are you, are you going to I'm, I'm yeah. going through the criteria here. Yeah. Um, I think it's a reduction in the vegetative buffer and uh, a substantial reduction in the vegetative and the adjacent regulated area. From 1552 to 56 in the no. vegetative buffer yeah. and 3,386 in the existing in the adjacent to 766. I agree. So that's, that's huge. Uh, it's adding dry wells for water collection. Mm -hmm. It's replacing turf lawn with uh, natural vegetation and others. Uh, number two, the project proposed project will not diminish any wetland in size unless the approving authority finds that the proposed activity is water dependent or requires access to the wetland as a central element of its basic function and will result in the minimum possible alteration or impact of the wetland. Um, I, it's not diminishing the wetlands. No, it's actually expanding them. Yeah. The proposed project will not have a negative impact on the quality and quantity of groundwater. What's the word? Nothing. They've they offered a positive than negative. Five gallon per, uh, per minute well for a lower draw. Um, there um, the cisterns and then the cistern overflow and the dry wells. And the swells. Garden, Number five, the applicant has demonstrated that there are no applicable alternatives which allow the project to be constructed outside the regulated area. Practical alternatives are presumed to be available unless the applicant clearly demonstrates otherwise. In making this determination, note that the planning board generally finds that conducting the proposed regulated activity on the side or landward side of the house is highly preferred to conducting it within the regulated area. Maybe walk through many potential alternatives, none of them seem to work. Yeah, it pushes it into the front yard setback if they maintain all the distances and <coughs> sizes of what they're looking right. for. Um, the applicant has submitted information to describe alternative site locations and configurations sufficient for a determination that the proposed work and location would have a less adverse environmental impact than any other practical alternative in order to be approved. Practical alternatives that are constructed entirely outside the vegetative buffer are presumed to have less adverse impacts on the wetlands than projects that do not meet such standards, unless the applicant clearly demonstrates otherwise. Well, as you guys were pointing out, they could build over the existing footprint That's right. and build up. And so this is pulling it substantially out, in fact. Um, the standard notes of uh, we're going to put into the plan there, obviously the landscaping plan, um, wire belt sill fencing. Um, I was actually very impressed with the vegetation plan. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably one of the most thorough one I've seen. Mm -hmm. I feel sorry for the board's environmentalist has to go substantially. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's going to be some work, Yeah, but it's good. That's all I have on that one. Is that enough? Would you? Yep. Yeah, that's good. It's just a good improvement. I mean, it's going to be a beautiful place. We have um, another application, the flowers at 10 Cheekwood Avenue, but they're still at the ZBA and we're, we're wondering about that. Holding pending there for termination. We have two special permit applications for oversized houses, five with a boat and one pandium. They're on hold pending the town moratorium. So on that note, um, I make a motion to close the October 10th, 2023 planning board meeting. I will second that. All in favor? Aye. I am going to just uh, ask the board members to stay um, 